This video was made possible by CuriosityStream. Get access to my streaming video service, Nebula, when you sign up for CuriosityStream using the link in the description. Hi everyone, Jade here. I'm a pretty slow learner, so earlier this year I hired a script writer to help write scripts for the channel so I could produce more videos. His name is Jules and he's written some of the most popular videos on this channel. And he wrote this one. Now the reason I'm telling you this is because when I read this script, this topic, The Anthropic Principle, it really opened up a new way of thinking about science to me. I did an applied physics degree, so I'm very used to thinking about science as um, conducting an experiment and drawing conclusions from the experiment. And then theoretical physics comes in and stretches those conclusions to its limits. Usually these starting facts are observations we've made about our universe. But the anthropic principle starts with a very interesting observation. The fact that our universe is observable. Now this might not seem like the most radical idea to you, and it didn't to me at first, but as I saw and hopefully you'll see, its implications run very deep and fascinating theories can be drawn from this seemingly innocuous observation. In this video, I hope to convey to you some of the significance of this idea and inspire you to think deeply about how we go about understanding the world around us. So let's begin. It had been assumed for many years that the Earth, and hence we, were at the center of the universe and everything revolved around us. But then at the beginning of the 16th century, an astronomer named Nicholas Copernicus changed the course of physics forever. He proposed a new model of the solar system, which removed the Earth from the center and replaced us with the Sun. After Copernicus published his book and further evidence started rolling in, it was undeniable. We were just another planet orbiting just another star. And there was nothing special or privileged about our place in the universe. This was such a drastic shift in how we view our place in the universe that it's remained the dominant one until today. And it's served astronomers pretty well over the years. It's definitely how I've always thought about our existence. But in 1973, an Aussie physicist, Brandon Carter, thought hard about this trusted principle. He thought about how, at least in some ways, we might have reason to believe we do exist in a special place in the universe. His line of reasoning began like this. Our location in the universe is necessarily privileged to the extent of being compatible with our existence as observers. Because we're made out of flesh and carbon, we at least needed to arise in a part of the universe that supports fleshy and carbony type beings. It's not random that we exist on a rocky planet near a star rather than in intergalactic space, because even though there is much more intergalactic space in our universe, it isn't particularly flesh friendly. Similarly, the time in which we find ourselves in the universe is not purely random. If the universe were too young, planets wouldn't have had time to form and neither would complicated elements like carbon. If the universe were too old, most stars would be too dense to support stable planetary systems like our solar system. So we're kind of in this Goldilocks time and place of existence, which isn't random at all. Carter called this the weak anthropic principle, and it's pointing out a kind of selection bias to us. It tells us that when trying to answer questions like why do we exist in this time and place in the universe, we have to take into account the factors that allow us to exist. Here's a good time to point out that this principle doesn't apply just to human life, as the word anthropic would suggest, but applies to any life or life form capable of observing the universe. But Carter didn't let his questioning stop there. He extended his line of reasoning. If our time and place in the universe is such that it must allow us to exist, then it follows that all of the laws of physics are such that they allow us to exist. This is called the strong anthropic principle. And okay, it might not seem like the most radical idea to you. It didn't to me at first. I thought, well, yeah, the laws of physics must allow us to exist, otherwise we wouldn't. But let me give you some context. Physics has this reputation of being beautiful and elegant, and of course, some parts of it are. The general theory of relativity, for example, is beautiful because so much flows out of so little. Results like these give many physicists hope of a grand unifying theory of everything, where all the laws will beautifully and effortlessly fall into place and the universe will make sense. 
But then there are other parts of physics which are, well, not so beautiful. Let's take a look at the standard model of particle physics. The standard model is our best theory of the elementary particles and the forces that govern their interactions. It's a major achievement in physics and it's pretty successful at making predictions about a lot of phenomena in the universe. Now these are their masses expressed in terms of the electron mass. Do you see a pattern? No? Neither does anybody else. Unlike the elegant theory of gravity whose extraordinary results were drawn from simple observations, the standard model was discovered in a different way. All of the particles and their properties were found separately by experiment in a lab. And that's it. There doesn't seem to be any underlying pattern or relations to special mathematical constants. As far as we know, there's no deep reason for any of them. The standard model doesn't explain itself. Its properties seem like they could have been anything. The standard model is the current most fundamental description of nature and it doesn't seem to be beautiful or elegant or special at all. Well, actually it is special in one way. It allows the existence of life. Physicists have done large scale simulations of our universe with very powerful computers. And what they find is that if you tweak most of the constants of nature, even by the tiniest amount, the universe turns out radically different. If electrons were a tiny bit lighter and photons a tiny bit heavier, atoms wouldn't be able to form. If the masses of some quarks were only a smidge different, no complexity would be possible. If the nuclear forces were different, stars wouldn't be able to form, or if they did, they'd burn out in a cosmic blink of an eye. No stars means no solar systems and no place for us fleshy humans. Likewise, no atoms means no chemistry, no complexity and no life. The standard model just happens to, for no apparent reason, allow the existence of nuclei and atoms that eventually assemble themselves into the large molecules of life. The range of values that allows life is really narrow. Like, really narrow. And so far we haven't found any reason for why the laws of physics are the way they are. So on one hand, it seems totally surprising that they just happen to fit into this tiny sliver where life can form. But on the other hand, it's not surprising at all. Because if it were any other way, we wouldn't be here to observe them. This is the heart of the anthropic principle. It's not saying that the universe was tailor-made to our existence, although some versions do, but we're not going to talk about those today. It's saying that the fact that we're here at all limits the ways in which the universe and therefore the laws of physics must be. Think about it this way. Pretend you're an astrophysicist and you want to measure the fraction of all galaxies that lie in particular ranges of brightness. But it's not enough to list all the galaxies seen according to their brightness, for the simple reason that many galaxies are too faint to be seen. So your observations are biased toward the very bright galaxies. You must therefore correct for this selection bias. All instruments are subject to some sort of selection bias. The anthropic principle reminds us that we are also a type of measuring instrument and we need to remember our biases and limitations when interpreting information about the universe. When we ask the question, why are the laws of physics the way they are? We need to remember that our existence means they couldn't be any other way. Now, some people really don't like this way of reasoning and I can understand why. It's been accused of discouraging further search for a deep meaning to the values of um, the universe. Like maybe there is a deep unifying theory for the values of the standard model and we just haven't found it yet. But putting that aside for now, let's continue down this train of thought. Carter continued his mind escapade and thought we may be able to explain why the laws of nature are the way they are by assuming that there's more than one universe. A large and possibly infinite collection of universes where the laws of physics vary drastically. Something like a multiverse. Now, this is a pretty big leap from the facts that we've been given. It does kind of seem like Carter's fallen off the wagon at this point. So what do actual cosmologists have to say about this theory? Well, at first, those who rooted for the idea of a unifying theory of everything set out to destroy this idea. They created string theory, 
which unifies gravity and quantum mechanics and is what a lot of cosmologists consider to be the most promising theory of fundamental physics. However, things didn't turn out quite as they'd hoped. Instead of a single set of unifying laws, string theory predicts a landscape of possible ways the universe could be. In other words, string theory backs up Carter's multiverse idea. Some of the possible locations on the landscape produce universes where only black holes can exist. Some locations have matter spread out impossibly far from one another so that no complexity ever arises, and other locations that look like our very own universe. Some cosmologists say that we can use the anthropic principle as a guide to help physicists figure out which points on the string theory landscape might describe our own universe. Multiverses will be the topic of my next video, so make sure to subscribe if you'd like to find out more. So the first thing that I find eye-opening about the anthropic principle is the idea that there might not be a deep reason for the laws of physics. I guess I've always subscribed more to the view of the elegant unifying theory of everything, that one day we'll find the equations that unite gravity and quantum physics and everything will make sense and the universe will be beautiful and neat and elegant and simple. This was the first time it really occurred to me that, hey, maybe it's all just random, maybe the universe doesn't make sense and there isn't a deep reason for the standard model. So that was really um, interesting to me because this would totally change the way that we view physics if it were true. For one, we would stop looking for a unifying theory of everything. But as I mentioned earlier, I can understand why some people really don't like this line of reasoning. It, it does seem like it could be an easy way out, you know, like maybe we should just stop looking for a theory of everything because maybe there isn't one and the standard model, you know, um, it's all just random anyway. So I can understand that that seems a bit like a cop out. The second thing I found really interesting was the idea of us humans as measuring devices. I never really considered myself as a measuring device before, but when you think about it, it makes total sense. I mean, we are the ones doing the measuring and the observing, so it makes sense to consider our own limitations and biases and our existence just as we would of any other measuring device like a telescope or microscope. But it never occurred to me before now. For my regular viewers, you may have noticed that I haven't uploaded a video for a while, and this is because a few weeks ago I had my first ever existential crisis, and it was a big one. I'm talking, you know, what is the meaning of life? What is the nature of reality and the universe? How can we even know what's truth? How do we know what we know? How do we know what's real? The whole shebang. So I've started getting really interested in pure philosophy. I feel like to live a purposeful life, I need to spend some time thinking and exploring about these questions, which is why I'm starting a philosophy series on Nebula. Nebula is a streaming video platform built by and for independent creators like CPG Grey, Braincraft, Minute Physics, 12 Tone, Knowing Better, and Real Engineering. We're building Nebula because we want a place for educational creators to try out new content ideas that might not work on YouTube, like my philosophy series. Normally, Nebula is $3 a month, but we've partnered with our friends at CuriosityStream to get you free access to Nebula with a CuriosityStream subscription. CuriosityStream is a subscription streaming service with thousands of high-quality documentaries. They have a huge science collection, including titles like Exploring Quantum History with Brian Greene and Order and Disorder with Jim Al-Khalili, not to mention their stunning production value. It's definitely worth checking out if you're into documentaries of any kind. CuriosityStream loves independent creators and wants to help us grow our platform, so they're offering Up and Atom viewers free access to Nebula when you sign up at curiositystream.com slash upandatom. By signing up to CuriosityStream, you'll be helping not just me, but the entire educational community as we work together to build a place where we can create whatever our hearts desire without the pressure of pleasing the YouTube algorithm. The first video I have in mind for my philosophy series is what can we know? I figure it's a good place to start, right? I mean, if you want to understand the nature of reality, you first need to understand your own limitations and the nature of how you go acquiring understanding. This is all totally new to me and I'd love some company along the way. So if you're interested in joining me on my journey of self-discovery, um, sign up to CuriosityStream using the link in the description. Until next time, Bye.